to be uh, together here in fellowship in the Lord. Wouldn't you agree? I want to say thank you all for having me. Uh, it's always an honor to be here. If you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to be looking mainly in the book of Isaiah in the 41st chapter. If we could, let us bow our heads and have a brief word of prayer. Father God, we come before you this morning humble God and full of praise. Every day that we get to wake up and to bless your name, to seek your will, and to share your love and your joy with others is a blessing. Father God, I ask that you would take, you've heard the prayers that are on, uh, that were spoken this morning, you know all the needs, those spoken and unspoken, I ask that you would do a strong and mighty work in all of those lives. I pray God that you would do a strong and mighty work in each body here in this building and every person who hears this message today. Pierce our hearts, God. Do not let us walk out the same way that we were when we walked in. Father, we love you. We give you all the praise. We give you all the honor. And we give you all the glory. And we ask all these things that it would be by your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so this morning I want to talk to you about what is going on in the world today? What is happening in our society? Uh, and how do we deal with the complications of living in a world that is rapidly and rampantly embracing sin and disobedience? Uh, I told you to turn to uh, the book of Isaiah. And the reason I told you that today, the reason I chose Isaiah is because of the similarities in the culture of their day as to what we see in our current day. We know that Isaiah is a prophetic book. And the first half of Isaiah is pretty tough and pretty dark. God lays out some pretty harsh consequences. Uh, we know that in that time, many of the people, just like here in America or anywhere in this world for that matter, in, in today's culture, many of the people at that time, uh, they had strayed away from God and they had therefore fallen into his wrath and they had fallen under oppression and uh, captivity from their enemies. We see the very same things happening right here in this country today, and you see it in other countries all over the world. And we have to ask ourselves, well, why is that? Mostly because of sin, but what we really also need to focus on is how do we deal with that? In every society from the beginning of creation, there have been people who have closely followed God and who have endured terrible hardships brought on by the rest of the world around them. So how, how can we deal with that? How do we cope with those challenges in our walk and how can we change the world around us? So with that being said, let's find some encouragement in the word. Join me now. We're going to be starting in verse number 8 and we're going to look at 8 through 10. So beginning in verse 8. But you, Israel... My servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. One more time, let us pray just one more time with that. Father God, I come before you this morning to humbly ask God that you would open our eyes, God, that we would see you. <coughs> that in everything, no matter how dark the trial, no matter what is going on in the world around us, that our eyes would be focused on you, God. That we would never forget everything that you have done for us, everything that you have given for us, and the love that you provide us with. The love to love you first and to love others around us. And God, just pierce hearts with this message. Do it now, God. Don't wait another second. We love you. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. So, I titled today's message, Fear Not If You Trust in the Lord. Fear Not If You Trust in the Lord. Now, there's a key word there, if. 
If you have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to understand that there is nothing this world can throw at you that you should fear. And this message is telling you to overcome your fear, to conquer that fear with faith. So I want to share a couple of points to encourage you and inspire you in your walk with Christ. The first point that we have, it's important to understand who we are to God and who he is to us. I'm going to say that again. It's crucial to understand who you are to God and who he is to you. So let's look at some things here. Number one, the first thing that we see is we are God's servants. And all mankind, I want you to understand this, all mankind is going to serve in one way or another. You're either going to be a servant or a slave. So what's the difference? Well, let's look. Servants are not forced to serve, but do so willingly and graciously. This is because servants are loyal to their master because they love him, and they are loved by their master. As a matter of fact, they are cherished and loved by their master. The servant's role is fulfilled in love. I want you to understand that. The servant's role is fulfilled in love. So if you have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then your role is fulfilled in his love. When you step aside and you give Jesus the reins and you put Jesus in control of your life, how you choose to live, uh, live your life, the things that you choose to do, be it if a stranger comes up out of nowhere and drops a little money down and says, hey, I would like to bless your day. I've been blessed and I want to do the same. If you see a brother or a sister that's hurting and you take the time and you don't say, hey, I'm going to pray for you, but you take the time and walk over there and grab them by the hand and you say, pray with you. All of those are actions that are fulfilled in love because Christ first loved you. But then you have the slave. The slave's role, however, is merely accomplished out of obligation. It has no fulfillment and it ultimately results in vanity. So I want you to understand something there. Just real basic and real quick. The slave's role is purely out of obligation. The slave does what he does. He serves because he has to. Now, you might find an opponent of Christ might say it like this. Well, I'm not forced to do anything. I choose. I choose to live the carefree life. I choose to go on like so many people in society questioning uh, certain things. Uh, They'll, they'll question uh, gender roles or question their sexuality or question why we are to do the things we do. And so therefore, they say that they choose their path. But I want you to understand, in choosing their path, they are only choosing a path that is still serving. They are serving themselves and they are serving a sinful master known as Satan. Sin begins with self, guys. So if you are not serving the Lord and you are serving yourself, then you are a slave, not a servant. That is very important. So I say this. Let's be servants. Because there's blessings in being a servant. Now, let's add to that a little bit. Not only are we servants, but we are chosen by God. You, each and every one of you in this room, are chosen by God. In his omniscience, God knows who's going to receive him. He knows who will choose to hear his word. He knows who will choose to receive that word when they hear it. No one, and absolutely no one, comes to salvation. No one comes to a relationship with Jesus apart from the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's a praise right there. You were chosen. God loves you. He sought you out. And he said, I am going to pour myself into you. That's a beautiful thought. And if you look at that verse, uh, it ends with something else. It says, uh, when you look at verse number nine, the, the last part of that, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you out. <laughs> That brings us to our next point. Not only are we chosen by God, but we are also kept by God. 
If you genuinely follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then nothing, and I mean absolutely nothing in this world, can separate you from him. You cannot be pulled out of the hands of Jesus. Now, I do want to explain something, guys. I am not preaching a hyper-grace message here. I am not saying, uh, I'm not just doing the once saved, always saved. I'm not saying it's okay to go out there and take I prayed a prayer one time and I gave my life to Jesus and not have any fruit to show for. As Christians, we are to examine ourselves daily. We are to examine our walk and to make sure that our walk is following Christ. We need to make sure that Christ is the model that we are aiming for because if you say that you follow Jesus but there is absolutely no testimony, no fruit to show it, I would advise you to check again and make sure that salvation experience was genuine. But see, there's the hope of the situation for those who it is. And I believe everyone in this room is, I hope. And for a, a world that is, when you see the darkness, you see the filth that is surrounding our world, the, uh, the violence People are seeking power. They're seeking authority. They're seeking wealth. And it's gotten to a point where they will do anything to get it. It can make the world a scary place to live. But God has already told you he's chosen. And he's told you that he's kept you. Nothing can happen in this world that will snatch you out of his hands. Praise God for that. And so, one last thing before we move on to the next part. Who is God to us? Well, it's simple. God is our God. The people of Israel in the time that uh, the book of Isaiah was written, one of the biggest issues that they faced were they were serving other gods. They were serving their own gods that they had created. We've all done that at times in our lives before we come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Some people make uh, their money their gods. Some people make their jobs their, their gods and, and the success in a career. Uh, others make lifestyle their gods. But it's whatever you put your focus and your energy into that becomes your God. For those of us who call ourselves children of God, who call Jesus our Lord and Savior, God is our God. Who is He? He is our Father. He is our protector for everything. I said earlier that we are servants. He tells us, you are my servants. Well, if we are his servants, then he is our master. And not only is our, he our master, he is also our hope. So that tells you who you are to God, who you are in Christ. And it also tells you who he is to you. You are his servant, you are chosen, and you are kept because you are loved. And he is your father, your protector, your master, who loves you and who demands your love in return. Now, a second point, and this is the most important thing. This is how we cope with a world that's engulfed in dastardly deeds. This is how we cope with a world that is strayed away from God that does not appreciate Christian values, who does not look at God the way he should. We must practice faith in our dependence in him to be our strength and our shield. Now, it's not just that you practice faith, because I want you to understand, everybody practices faith at some level. You walked in this building, you practice faith that there was going to be a building with chairs you could come in. When you sit down, you practice in faith that that <coughs> chair is going to hold you up. So there Everybody practices faith. It's what you place your faith in that matters. And with that being said, if you have your Bibles and you would, turn to the book of Psalms. The 28th Psalm, we're going to be looking at verses, I believe, 7 and 8. And this, David says this in this Psalm. He says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. In Him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exults, and with my song I give thanks to Him. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. Amen. That is such a beautiful point. David reinforces 
the importance of faith in our lives. And he does so by attributing his strength and courage to the Lord. On our own, we have no strength, none. I can't do anything on my own power. And if I try to do things on my own power, then all I do is vanity. It all goes back to the Lord. What does Paul tell us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13? He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We find our strength in the strength of the Father through our faith in Him. Now, we need to understand what faith is. What better place is there than the Bible to get a true, real definition of faith? And that can be found in the uh, 11th chapter of Hebrews, the very first verse. It opens that chapter with this. It says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I don't know if there's a more beautiful verse in Scripture, especially where it comes to faith. Faith is active. That's one thing I want you to understand. Faith is active and it cannot be be passive. If one's faith is passive, then he does not have faith at all. None. You cannot have faith that's sitting on the sidelines doing nothing. That would be like the people that say, well, love is just a feeling that I feel. No, love is an action. And just as love is an action, so is faith. And faith is demanding. Faith truly conquers our fear and replaces it with courage, strength, joy, and hope. I want to read that verse to you again, 41.10. It says this, it says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What is God telling you there? He is saying, have faith, because I will take care of you. Have faith. I will provide for you. I will help you. I will strengthen you. God himself is our ultimate example of faith. He's our ultimate example of faith and the faith that he practices on our behalf. Do you not understand that creation, the very being of this planet we call earth, our home, is an act of faith. The birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was an act of faith. <clears throat> when God's chosen people had revolted, rejected Him, rebelled against Him, there was no way to bridge that gap back to Him. Sacrifices were not going to cut it, and God knew that. So on faith, He sent His Son. And on faith, His Son, your Lord and Savior, stepped down from His throne in heaven. Now I want you to understand something that a lot of people don't think. Jesus never had to step down from heaven. He chose to step down from heaven because a servant does not have to do the things he does he chooses to. Move a little further. His willingness to go to the cross to pay to the propitiation of our sins was an act of faith. So he knew what was coming to him. He knew just how bad it was going to be. He knew that he would be rejected by men. He knew that those who were of his own family, his own village, would mock him, would spit in his face. He knew that they would beat him in a beating that no one in this room could endure. And he knew that they would nail him to a tree. My biggest shame is that I'm the one that done it. Just as each and every person who walks the face of this earth has. But in faith, he went. And we know what happens later. We know that in faith he went, and in faith, three days later, there was an empty tomb. The stone had been rolled away. Praise God for that. And then we know that what's he also do? He sends the Holy Spirit. He tells his disciples, I am sending one to help you. When you kind of struggled and stumbled, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we're not perfect and we will stumble along the way. The Holy Spirit is there to convict you, to guide you, and to bring you back. All of that is acts of faith. And the most important thing 
the giving of his grace is an act of faith. Every time a lost soul comes under conviction, turns to Jesus, repents of their sins, and puts their trust and their faith in the Lord, an act of faith is committed. On faith, he gives them grace, and through faith, they achieve and receive salvation. There is not a more beautiful picture in all the world than you will, that you will see than a lost soul coming home, finding his way back to the Father. God daily intervenes in the lives of his children to guide them and to protect them and to bring them back closer to himself. So daily God is investing in you. Daily he's intervening in your life. Sometimes it's an easy, simple deal because you're basically walking the path. Other times you stumbled and strayed and it might not be so easy because sometimes God has to, to nudge us a little bit. Sometimes he has to outright shut us. But I want you to understand this. He's intervening every day. And I also want you to, to think about this. In being a servant, you better love the slave. Because God does. Because there was a time when each and every one of you in this room was a slave. But by faith, he loved you. He spoke to you. He called you out. And you come to know the Lord. And that's why it's important we must do the same. Our response in faith must be just like his. We have to step out and act and know that he is in control and trust him and lean on him. That's what faith is, is leaning on Jesus and knowing that on your own you can do nothing. In practicing our faith in God, we are promised protection. We're promised protection and strength and in his provision, and our victory is guaranteed in him. I want you to think about that. You're protected, you're provided for, and you're guaranteed the victory. Not just promised or not just offered the victory, guaranteed the victory. Each and every one of you in this room who have made Jesus your Lord and Savior, you have the victory. Now, we do know that there are shorter victories and losses in the battles that we face day to day. But the real victory, the victory in the war for your soul has already been won. And how many victories you have in your daily life is up to you. The more faith you practice, the more victories you will have. With that being said, in closing this message, I just want to encourage you. No matter what you're facing, no matter how bad things this world, in this world, no matter how bad they may seem, no matter how much is going on around you that is scary, that is dark, that is ugly, nothing, and I do mean absolutely nothing, is too big for the Lord. I'm going to say that one more time. Nothing is too big for the Lord. And if you're willing to place your faith in Him and trust Him with all your heart, with all your soul, your mind, your strength, if you're willing to trust Him with your life, He will forgive you of your sins. He will become your strength and He will lead you unto victory. I want you to think about that. He will forgive your sins and He will become your strength. The only strength we really have is the strength that we have in Jesus. Don't lose the fight for your soul, guys. Do not risk death. That is a battle that is far too important to lose. And then love the world. Love those in the world. Don't, don't love its ways. Don't love the, the secular values. But love others enough to be willing to share that message that they don't want to lose that fight. Whatever you need, whatever need you may have, if you need somebody to pray with, if you need uh, just to come to the altar and pray, this altar is open. So I would ask you now, let us bow our heads and have one final closing prayer. Thank you. Father God, we come before you this morning. 
this world is, is dark. God, it's, it's getting darker by the day. We see so many things, so many atrocities, so many sins. But God, I just want to say thank you because even in the darkest moments, God, you are still a bright, shining light that cannot and will not be dim, God. And I praise you, God, for giving us the strength, the encouragement, God, to not only endure the things that are going on in this world, God, but to make a stand for you, God, to celebrate you for who you are and what you have done for us. To give us the strength, God, your strength, to go out and be a brighter light and to brighten up this dark world and to bring all those who are hurting, who are lost, who are afflicted, all those who would hear and receive your word, that we would bring them home to you. Father God, I pray right now that if there's anyone in this room that doesn't know you, or maybe someone that knows you but they're, they're struggling and they need. Convict their hearts, God. Bring them forward so that we can pray together. We love you. We give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And we thank you. In Jesus' name. And all God's children say, Amen.